Well, I have some good news in store. Last week, uh, we started a series, and we talked about suffering, suffering and strengthening, and it was a bit heavy, and so I thought for my birthday, we would do something a little more lighthearted, so we're going to be talking on martyrdom and persecution. (laughs) You can put the slide up. There it is. A saint being martyred. Uh, martyrdom, persecution, and the courage to endure. That's right. If this is your church home, I am your weird pastor that chose to preach on this today. Uh, just a lighthearted, seeker-sensitive service for you. Um, I'm actually really thrilled about this, and so we're going to dive in in just a second. Would you guys stand up with me? We're going to pray as we get into this teaching. Why don't you go ahead and just grab the hand of the person next to you. Yeah, Holy Spirit, we honor your presence this morning. You are so good, God. Thank you for being with us. We are never alone. One of the greatest promises that we have, that you are with us. And we thank you, Lord, that you are expanding the revelation of your nearness, your goodness, your faithfulness. And um, I thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Spirit released in the room today. I thank you, God, that as we are talking on this, the subject of martyrdom and persecution, that there would be a shifting within each and every one of our lives, that we would see that we are part of something greater that we are part of the story of Jesus and the kingdom, that we are those who are joining with the saints from thousands of years to join in the chorus and the anthem of the King of glory. And I thank you that you are shaking us. You are bringing that holy disruption in our lives. I even just speak right now for anyone that has lulled off to sleep spiritually that today would be an awakening within you. I really feel this is a season of awakening. I thank you, God, that you are both comforting and awakening. And so lead us onward, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Is anyone else just hungering? Just stay standing for a moment. Is anyone just hungering for the Lord? Sure. I want us to just be radically people of his presence. Hey. I don't want to just rush on with more programs and services. This is about the king of glory here with us. I just even bless you right now with a greater awareness of his presence. Let the thick, tangible glory of the king of glory be here. Maybe we can just take a moment, and, and I just was hearing the, the song, Let It Rain, which the reign of the Lord is his presence resting upon us, falling in this place. Can we sing that together? Let it rain, let it rain, and open the floodgates of heaven, and let it Let it rain, let it rain. 
To the worthy one, we give our song, our lives, and I exalt thee. I thank you, God. Come and breathe upon this time. We want to honor you, Lord Jesus with our song, with how we open the word, with how we, we look at what, what you're doing, where your hand is. We wanna honor you with our career path, with our relationships, with every part of us. Let it be worship unto you. Amen. Let's have a seat. I just want to remind us, like, this is not about just a, a performance up here. And so just, just continue to, to host and foster that, that touch of Jesus. I mean, that's the greatest part of our faith, that we have a, a living God interactive, a relationship. This is not about just religion. This is about relationship with him. And so we have the, the privilege, the honor of opening up the word of God that is Jesus made manifest, speaking his voice to us. And the Holy Spirit illuminates truth in our lives. It is the very substance of life and nourishment within us. And so even today, we're going to look at a few examples from scripture and we're going to look at some examples throughout history, church history, and we're going to be looking at today what persecution and martyrdom looks like globally because we are part of a global family, the global church. And so I believe there's going to be a shifting in our lives. Sometimes we just got to get out of our own bubbles, amen? Sometimes we got to get out of the things that are just the, the, the little frustrations in our life that can feel all-consuming. And sometimes looking at the greater picture, the, the greater story arc, allows us to snap out of that really selfish thinking. We all, we all you know, get into those rhythms sometimes. But when we start to actually live selflessly before him, that's where we find true life. And so I'm actually thrilled to talk about this. Martyrdom. Martyrdom and persecution. You ready? A martyr. Martyr originally meant witness, but it became a common term for one who died for Christ. Therefore, confessor became one that proclaimed the lordship of Jesus. So we are all confessors, but martyrs are those that we have defined as those that have given up their lives for the sake of Jesus. Roman rule brought the majority of early church persecution, especially around the Jewish war of 70 AD. But the earliest Christians were facing persecution from Jewish leaders who were terrified that the Jewish faith would be split in two. Does anyone know who the very first documented martyr is? Stephen, Stephen. good job, Bible school students. <laughs> Stephen, so let's open up to Acts chapter six. Acts 6, the year was 35. Stephen was stoned to death by the order of the Jewish council. And among those executors present was a man that we know as Saul. He later had a radical conversion that we're going to talk about. His name was changed to Paul, the author of the majority of the New Testament books. 
Stephen first was mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5, called a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Do your friends know you as a man or a woman full of faith in the Holy Spirit? I want to be that. It says in verse 8 that great wonders and signs were among the people, that, that he was partnering with the Holy Spirit to see signs and wonders revealing who Jesus is. Jewish leaders began to argue with Stephen, and in verse 10 it says, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. I mean, that is the cry of my heart when I'm speaking to anyone about faith. Like, I can, I can try to give my best answers, but ultimately, I want the Holy Spirit to take over. Amen. Holy Spirit, give wisdom. Yeah. Bypass the, the things where I feel like I gotta, I gotta get in there and, and, and make sure that they understand everything. It is the Spirit of God that brings that revelation, yeah. revelation and that wisdom. Yeah. And then in verse 15, it says, All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Again, they're just describing each and every one of us when we talk to our non-Christian believers. Face of an angel. And so he's being questioned here by the high priest. We have this incredible presentation of the gospel that Stephen brings forth that really sets them off. He gives an incredible presentation that you can look at in your own time. And I love the description that they ground their teeth at him. What a descriptor. And now turn over to Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Acts 7, 55. It says, But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered, the, this is so dramatic, they covered their ears, la, 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 <laughs> that's what I picture, <laughs> covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at, a feet, at the feet of a young man named Saul. They laid their coats. I feel like there's this this meaning of authority being laid at the feet of Saul. It was as if he was approving of what they were doing. Verse 59, while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, which we know means that he passed on into eternity. Acts chapter 8 tells us that Saul indeed did approve of this, this execution, the persecution began to arise within, within the land that day against the church, and Christians were then scattered. At this time, Rome was ruling over the territory, and they had built some expert roads. In fact, you can go to Israel today and see some Roman roads from 2,000 years ago. Well, these very roads that were built became the great scattering of the saints into all of the region. And quickly, like a wildfire, the gospel began to spread. And I gotta say, any time throughout church history, there is persecution among the church. The gospel indeed does spread like wildfire. You're gonna see that theme each and every time. And so here is this man, Saul, this young upright man saw that they were laying their coats at his feet as he approved this execution. And Saul is out to hunt down these so-called Christians. And so he's on his way to Damascus to do just that. And while he was on his way to Damascus, on the road to Damascus, he is pushed off his donkey, blinded with a flashing light, and hears the voice say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul, who he will come to be, is blinded by this magnificent light. He tells us later in his letters that he saw the the resurrected Lord at this encounter. Let's read now in Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 17. 
the Lord had prepped a man named Ananias who was to minister to Saul. And Saul was to go to him blinded, literally blinded by this. And watch what happens in Acts 9.17. Then Ananias, who was a Christian, went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he has sent me to you. You may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized. I love that. Immediately was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. He didn't have a little dinner and then was baptized. Baptized and then had a little food. <laughs> Regaining his strength. And the, the, the visual of like scales falling off his eyes. I love that. It's like I often pray that for, for my friends that don't yet know Jesus or haven't seen him in the fullness of his glory. My God, let the scales fall off of their eyes. And some of you here today, you're like, I feel like I can't experience or see this man, Jesus. And somehow I've ended up in this room and I have to a degree a hunger to encounter him. And this story of a man that was persecuting Christians ends up in one encounter having the scales fall off of his eyes to be able to see the magnificence of the risen King Jesus, give his life, be baptized, and then see a complete 180. And all of the giftings, so to speak, that were used against the kingdom became forces for the glory of God. And I think that every single person is one encounter away from seeing the same thing erupt in their lives. One encounter away to see the scales fall off of their eyes, their ears, and their hearts, to see the magnificence of Jesus, and to come into the kingdom and see the world change through their lives. This is possible. Even those that you've given up hope on. I'm speaking this for myself. I have those that I believe I've given up hope on. But in one encounter, they can come into the kingdom and see radical transformation. This is the God that we serve. Because Saul, now name changed Paul, because he was a Roman citizen, he, he went out through all of the Mediterranean preaching the good news. He was an apostle. He was bringing a, this is a Roman term, apostle, which means a, a change in culture. These apostles in a Roman government would be sent out to see a Roman way of life instituted in different settings that the Roman Empire was ruling. And in a Christ-following kind of way, an apostle will be sent out, a sent out one, to change the culture for the kingdom of God. And so Paul was sent out into all of the Mediterranean to see individuals come to know the Lord and to see culture changed for the kingdom of God, to bring correction in churches where it was needed, because this was new. They didn't even yet have the word of God established. So he had to bring a correction, he had to bring a rootedness, he had to bring pillars in the faith for, for this new church that was birthed. And so after Saul, after Saul became Paul and he lived all of these lives going out and he was shipwrecked and he was beaten and he was persecuted for all of these years, eventually he was brought to Rome and he was beheaded. And I don't know if you guys have heard this legend, which may be true, but there is a legend that when he was beheaded, are you ready for some supernatural interaction this morning? Yeah. When, when Paul was beheaded, legend says that his head was chopped and that it bounced three times. And every time his head bounced, water sprang up from the ground. There were three springs that came from the ground from the place of his head hitting it. If that's outside of your grid, sorry, maybe, I don't know. But these springs are called aqua salvie. And up until 1950, water was distributed from these springs of faithful pilgrims. But it wasn't until 1950 that the ground started become, becoming 
polluted, and so they had to cover them up. But these three symbolic monumental covers were placed over every, every one of them, each three, all three of them, where Paul's head had touched. I think that's just an interesting, it's, it's not found in scripture, but you can go with, go with the legend, go with areas of history. And uh, I just think these things are pretty fascinating. I'm gonna share a few stories of martyrs where there were miraculous things that took place. The disciples of Jesus. During the first century after Jesus' death, nearly all of his disciples suffered martyrdom for his sake. James, the son of Zebedee, was beheaded. Philip was crucified. Matthew was killed with an axe-like weapon. James, brother of Jesus, was beaten to death. Matthias was beheaded. Andrew was crucified. Mark was torn to pieces. Peter was crucified up, upside down. Crucifixion was, was common at this time. And Peter said, I don't e- I'm not even worthy to be martyred the same way as my Lord and Savior. Crucify me upside down. Jude, Bartholomew, Thomas were also martyred. Other early apostles, Luke, Barnabas, Timothy, Simon, were also killed for the sake of Christ. In fact, when we look at the disciples and followers of Jesus, this is something that supports the the truth of the gospel, that these men and women were giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. This was not just something that was a story that was running rampant. They gave their entire lives to preach the gospel, to live it, and to give their lives for Jesus. Another interesting thing to take note of is that often throughout the centuries, when individuals were being persecuted and eventually martyred, there was a Holy Spirit divine utterance that would take place in the time of them giving their lives. And so I'm going to quote from Mark 13, 11. It says, whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And so they took this to heart. This was a theme of the early church. They would go back to this passage. They said, when we're up in trial, we don't have to worry about what to say. The Holy Spirit's going to take over. And in fact, you can see documented cases. There's one that um, many individuals in Lyon, France, were martyred. And there were individuals that as they were up for trial, it said that it was documented that they were giving utterances like it was from the minor prophets. They were just giving downloads of the Holy Spirit and prophesying out things that were shaking the very territory. It was allowing individuals to have dreams and visions in the land, just hearing them prophesy. I love how the Holy Spirit, there's a grace released when we're under that kind of pressure. I want to now talk about Emperor Nero, the architect of early Christian martyrdom. 30 years after the crucifixion, Emperor of Rome, Nero, began a mass campaign of Christian persecution. Nero was known for being absolutely a psychopath. (laughs) He murdered his own mother. He regularly had occultic orgies. In the year 64, there was a great fire that broke out in Rome. Um, Some believe that Nero actually started the fire because he wanted to clear territory for his new palace. But instead of taking ownership, he wouldn't do that. Instead of taking ownership, he blamed the Christians. And so immediately he said, the Christians have started this fire And now what we're going to do to them is is paid back. And so Nero, accusing the Christians of starting the fire, he, he made these executions a public spectacle. Their death was made into a sport. He dressed them in animal skins. They were torn to pieces by dogs and crucified. Other Christians, he would hang up on poles. He would drench them in tar and light them on fire. In fact, it's known that he would light these Christians on fire as lights on the way to these orgies and parties. He is a messed up, demonized man. They said throughout the whole city, you could smell the sickening stench of burning flesh over Rome. And so the ways of death that we see are common were setting on fire, dismemberment. Um, There would be Christians sentenced to be divided into four. A lot of them would be tied from each arm and leg, and they would set wild horses attached to each and then just pull them apart. 
They would be eaten by lions. One of the most common ways to execute Christian martyrs was to throw them to the lions. This was usually reserved for the worst murderers or those who were slaves that had rebelled. They would keep the lions hungry for several days, and then they would cover the the victims with animal skin and with blood and then send them out to the lions. Ignatius of Antioch was one of many Christians who was killed in this manner. And then I, I talked about already, but crucifixion. One of the Romans' preferred methods of execution consisted of nailing victims to a wooden cross. We immediately think about Jesus' crucifixion and the mockery of, of the saints who followed Jesus being nailed to crosses. I want to talk about another kind of miraculous story that took place with an, a woman named Fotina. Some say her name is Fotini. Um, You're probably not familiar with her, but she is the woman at the well. And this is mostly an accepted story among the Greek Orthodox tradition. And so Fotina, once her life was changed by Jesus at the well, and, and he said, go and sin no more. Remember that she was an evangelist to her town? And she says, go, go to this man. He told everything about me. You've got, you've got to see this man, Jesus. He's the Messiah. Well, that, that flame that was ignited in her kept going. And she and her entire household were set ablaze with passion for the name of Jesus. In fact, there are stories about how when she was captured, she was sent to Rome, and they smashed her finger joints, but she felt no pain. Her hands remained unharmed. Nero ordered her and her sisters to be blinded and thrown in prison. So they blinded her and her five sisters, thrown into prison. Are you ready for the miracles? Nero's own daughter, Domnia, came to visit her because she had heard about the preaching of Fotina in the prisons. And what took place is that Fotini or Fotina and her five sisters, after three years of being in prison, all regained their sight. (laughs) Nero's daughter and her servants all came to Jesus. Even a sorcerer who came to bring poisoned food came to Jesus. People visited them to hear the preaching. The whole prison had been transformed into a bright and fragrant place where God was glorified. Nero then gave orders to crucify them beat their naked bodies with straps. But on the fourth day of this happening, fourth day of torture, he sent servants to see if they were still alive. But approaching the place of torture, all of the servants that came to observe, they all fell blind. Isn't this awesome? In a rage, Nero gave orders to flay the skin, throw them down a well, because he had heard her testimony. So he threw her down a well. Um, A couple of her siblings had their legs cut off, thrown to dogs. Some of her sisters had terrible torments. They cut off their breasts, flayed their skin. Nero then took took her out of the well where she was experiencing torment and brought it back to him and asked if she would now relent and offer sacrifices to idols. Hearing these words, Nero gave orders after she denied, denied all of the idols and gave, said, absolutely not, this life is belonging to Jesus. Nero gave orders again to throw her down a well again where eventually her soul was surrendered to the Lord. I mean, I'm just hearing some of these stories and I'm like, my life is a piece of cake. I'm like, I am selfish. I, what, why am I complaining about anything? I, I'm, I'm complaining to myself that I have to wait two weeks for an iPhone upgrade. And it really puts things in perspective, doesn't it? Yes, uh, the uh at the end is like especially profound. All right, we're going to talk about Polycarp. Polycarp, a personal disciple of the Apostle John, 
and he was an old, sweet man. Imagine being a disciple of John, who was the beloved that rested his head on the chest of Jesus. He was a cuddly, soft, tender man. <laughs> so here, Polycarp becomes the bishop of the church of Smyrna in Asia, Asia Minor. This is present-day Turkey. Persecution against the Christians broke out in this region, and shock of all shocks, the believers were being fed to wild beasts in an arena. Think of Gladiator. And the crowd began to call out, bring us Polycarp. And so the leaders went out to find this man, and they found him in his home, studying, loving well. He invited them in to his home and says, let me, let me fix you a feast. Come and sit. He says, I will go with you, but can I pray for an hour? This turned into two hours, and all of these, these soldiers that came to arrest him were like, why are we taking this sweet old man? <laughs> They were convicted. And um, I'm sure the presence of the Lord was so, think it, tangible with him. And so the officers hearing the prayers that went on for two hours had second thoughts. Why were they arresting this old man? Despite the cries of the crowd, the Roman authorities saw the senselessness of making this older man a martyr. So when Polycarp was brought into the arena eventually, the proconsul pled with him, and says, please just curse Christ and I will release you, old man. Look at his reply. 86 years I have served him. He had never done me wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who has saved me? The proconsul then reached for an acceptable way out. He says, do this then, old man. Just swear by the genius of the, spirit, of the emperor that that will be su sufficient. If I could talk, the genius of the emperor, and that will be sufficient. And what that means, the genius was sort of like the spirit of the emperor. Just, just owe to him honor. Recognize the, the pagan gods and the religion. His reply again, if you imagine for a moment that I would do that, then I think you pretend that you don't know who I am. Hear it plainly, I am a Christian. Polycarp stood up. The proconsul threatened him again with wild beasts. He said, bring them forth. I would change my mind if it meant going from the worst to the better, but not to change from the right to the wrong. The patience of the proconsul was gone. I will have you burned alive. His reply, you threaten fire that burns for an hour and it's over, but the judgment of the ungodly is forever. The fire was prepared for Polycarp, but he lifted his eyes to heaven and prayed, Father, I bless you that you have deemed me worthy of this day and hour, that I might take a portion of the martyrs in the cup of Christ. Among these, may I today be welcomed before thy face as a rich and acceptable sacrifice. As the fire engulfed him, the believers noted that it smelled not like flesh burning, but it smelled like a loaf baking. He was finished off with a stab of a dagger. His followers gathered his remains like precious jewels and buried them on February 22nd. The year was 155. A man named Dennis of France. In the third century, he was a bishop of Paris and many of he and his friends were brought forward and persecuted. And he's probably the, the most famous individual that was beheaded in all of France. And what took place is, a, again, a legend, but had many individuals who were witnesses of this. This is going to be stretching for some of you. But as legend has it, he was beheaded, but then his body picked up the head and for miles began preaching about repentance. What? And that's stretching. <laughs> but that's a nice legend. Hey, who knows? But there's something about that that is mysterious and something about that that I just love. And the very place where he finally fell is the place that they would bury the kings of France. 
Martyrs in the Middle Ages. Um, I'm just going to brush through these, and you can study in your own time. One notable figure is Thomas Becket, the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then, please take note, women will like this, Joan of Arc. The theme of this time was from Revelation 2, verse 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And then we move on to the Reformation era. The Reformation era marked by Martin Luther nailing 95 theses to the door, and it sparked... Uh, sparked a challenge to the core tenets of the Catholic faith, setting the stage for true relationship with the Lord. One notable figure was William Tyndale, whose English translation made scripture accessible to the common person. Tyndale's work were heretical by definition by the, the Catholic Church, which led to his execution in 1536. Other martyrs to take note of were Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, burned at the stake for their refusal to recant their Protestant beliefs. What does modern persecution look like? If we look at some statistics, more than 70 million Christians have been martyred in the course of history. More than half of those martyred were in the 20th century alone. A lot of it was because of communist and fascist government. A lot of this is researched by Gordon Conwell University. In the 21st century, roughly 100,000 to 160,000 Christians were killed every single year globally. Roughly 1.1 to 1.6 million Christians were martyred between the year 2000 and 2010. The last 10 years, over 900,000 Christians were martyred. 65% of all Christians who have ever been persecuted or martyred lived in the years 1900 to 2000. There's an Italian journalist, Antonio Sochi, and he estimates that 45 million Christians were martyred in the 20th century alone. And we can think back about events such as um, starting in 1915, the Armenian genocide in Turkey. We can think about communist Russia, Starting in 1917, it's estimated that 20 million Christians were killed during that time. In Spain, in the the Spanish Civil War, we see bishops and priests um, imprisoned, beheaded, left for dead. Around um, 150,000 to 400,000 people who were opposing Franco at the time were killed. In the decades following the death of Mao Zedong, they realized that there was an estimate estimate that 45 to 70 million Chinese were killed. Untold number of Christians were killed because they opposed his views. The top 10 countries where Christians face the most extreme persecution, we see it in North Korea year after year, Somalia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and onward. We shouldn't be surprised by these things. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. What about modern persecution in Western culture? What does that look like for us today? Because we talk about these statistics, and these are some great numbers, overwhelming numbers. But what does this do for us? Why should we care, and what does it look like in our day-to-day? Well, some of you are called to the nations, I think, I think this is a house, I actually feel the Lord on this. This is meant to be a mission base to the ends of the earth. And I believe in the days and weeks and months to come, there's gonna be a fresh, I, I can see it now, there's like a spotlight on your life and you didn't realize it maybe even, but you're called to the nations. And some of you are gonna be called to some of these zones throughout the world 
where your life is gonna be at risk for the sake of the gospel. This house has a calling on it to be a house with a missional heart. We have a heart for what God is doing globally and we have a heart for our next door neighbor and we have a heart for our families and a heart for the city, but we have a heart to see the nations transformed by the power and love of Jesus. And I believe that part of this is a a compelling and highlighting within us to see what God is doing across the face of the earth, the glory of Jesus revealed to the ends of the earth, but also a holy shakening within us. I believe that when we're focusing on church history and also the, um, the, the things that we're facing right now with people giving up their lives for the sake of Jesus, it brings that holy disruption within us where even, even as we're hearing these stories, we're challenged. We're challenged where we have grown lukewarm. We're challenged where we have become complacent. We're challenged where we have compromised in different parts of life because there's a greater calling to be radical, to be bold, to be, to be one who is so undone with the beauty of Jesus, had such a revelation of who he is that you say, send me God, I will go anywhere to the ends of the earth to proclaim the glorious name of Jesus. And I really believe, I felt a shift especially last week, I felt a shift that this house is having a fresh awakening. We're having a fresh awakening. Can we let the Lord continue to massage and work that in each of our lives? Because we don't wanna just, we don't wanna just have this belief in Jesus as you know, something that, that's a book on, in our library. And like, going on with our lives per usual, but, oh yeah, I follow Jesus, you know, he's my guy. Like, I really believe that the Lord is shaking something within us. And in, in just a moment, we're gonna take communion and we're going to sing in worship. And I believe that there are parts of your heart I know in mine, as I've been studying this, there's parts of my heart that I need to give a fresh surrender. Like, I, I, I can't wait to worship. I feel like there's gonna be a holy surrender in the house today. That God is gonna do a deep work. That it's gonna be supernatural. And so with one voice, we get to give God the glory and say, this life and these lives are yours. And some of you, you say, I'll go anywhere. And the Lord's like, I got you right here in Los Angeles. And we all know this isn't the easiest place to live. It's pricey. Some of y'all are like, will I find my spouse here? But if God has called you to a place, there's going to be elements of persecution that take place. I was talking to a friend yesterday who she came to faith a year ago and she's, she's being confronted right now. I said, you don't know how prophetic your life is right now because I'm preaching on this tomorrow. But she's coming into these places with family and friends where they're making her feel stupid for her faith in Jesus. They're shaming her, outcasting her in different ways. And I don't want to go into the details because it's so private, but it's like there, there is this compelling within her, like, like, I have to give everything to Jesus, and I don't care what the world thinks around me. And sometimes we get stuffed under that pressure, but then the Holy Spirit arises and pus through that thing, right? And so I just feel like there's going to be a... a Ah, that resurrection power of Jesus in our lives today, where we can be bold, where we can be faithful. I mean, look at the life of Peter, the disciple, where he cowered under the pressure of, Are you, aren't you one of those followers of Jesus? Denied, denied, denied. Our, that's so powerful when he locks eyes with Jesus across the courtyard before Jesus is crucified. 
because Jesus knew and saw that Peter had indeed denied him. But that same Peter, filled with the power and the boldness of the Holy Spirit, ends up preaching the gospel all over, all over the empire, bold, full of the power of the Holy Spirit, seeing radical salvations take place. And so I believe that it's the power of the Holy Spirit awakened within us, not just a, like, muster it up, but letting the Holy Spirit bring that awakening within us. Amen? And so I'm going to go ahead and invite up the worship team. And we're going to have a bit of time of communion and ministry here. And in just a minute, um, we have four stations around the room. There's one by the kitchen, kitchenette. There's two up front here and one, I believe, by the, by the entrance. In just a moment, would you go ahead and grab the elements? And let's come back to our seats once you've grabbed that. And we're going to take that together. So go ahead when you're ready. All right, if you want to go ahead and get out the little wafer... break it in half. Let's just meditate for a moment on what Jesus has done. Let's remember the cross. Jesus shared this this last supper, this meal with his followers, his disciples, and he took bread and broke it. He says, this is my body broken for you. Actually, before we do this, I, I just felt like I like saw the little pause icon in the spirit. And I, I just want to take a moment, actually. Can we, can we get our hearts right before the Lord? I feel like some of us need to actually repent and um, repent of your sins. Repent of areas of your life that you've compromised but allow his resurrection power to come heal those places. So let's just take about 30 seconds. I also just want to say there's a warning in scripture that says that this is actually for believers. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, um, I don't want to embarrass you, but please don't take the elements today. And I want us to get our hearts right and to actually have some fear of the Lord when we're taking this. Though this is a symbol of his body, there's a supernatural grace and empowerment that comes as we take the elements. Thank you, Lord, for your broken body. I thank you, God, for by your stripes we were healed, as you declare. I thank you for the nourishment and the grace and the strengthening of your body on my behalf. And so we take the bread and we remember your broken body with thanksgiving. Let's take the bread together. I also want to just say that repentance is a beautiful thing. Repentance is actually what sparked, if you look throughout church history, every revival started with repentance. Every single one. There's a glory in repentance, turning back to Jesus, away from sin and death, back to the place of life. It's holy. It's so worth it. Thank you, God. Thank you for the grace. So go ahead and open up the the little cup here.
just hearing kind of loudly in my spirit, let this be healing. Can we let the blood be healing today? Healing for your bodies, healing for your broken heart, healing for your soul, your mind, where you've been tormented, where you've lost, where, where you've lost anything. Let there be a healing power released, a redemptive work by the blood of Jesus. So Jesus said, this wine of the new covenant, this blood, his love poured out for you. It's a blood that it redeems and restores and heals and makes all things new. It's resurrection power. So we remember the cross and we remember the empty tomb and we drink this cup and say, yes, Holy Spirit, move in power as we drink. Nourish us, heal us, awaken us, restore us. Let's drink this together. Let's go ahead and stand up together. I wanna just, family time. Like, again, it does not matter who's around us. If you wanna flood the front and come up here, if you wanna to kneel before the Lord, if you wanna dance, freedom in, in the house today, okay? But let this be that awakening within us. Let the Lord, we're not just doing, doing another song. Let Jesus meet us here today, amen? Can we go after it this morning? We want all that you have for us, God. We don't wanna settle for lack. We don't wanna see the bar lowered. Awaken us to life. Awaken us with a fresh love for you, Jesus no matter the cost. The things that we don't understand in the question marks, we even lay before you and say, this is my joy to trust you. So let's just come into that flow and that glory of the Spirit of God and his magnificent presence. Let the King of glory enter in. Shift our hearts to where they should be, full of his life. We're gonna worship for a little while and then we're gonna flow with what we feel like God might be doing. I have one thing that I feel led to do, but um, I just felt a couple people highlighted to call up here. If you guys can, can join me. Um, Catherine Snyder, if you're here, have you come up. Uh, Frankie, if you're here. Tanner, can I get you? And Michelle, can you guys come up? Um, just felt like you were highlighted and would love to just pray into um, what the Lord might be doing. I think I want to start with when the Lord first called me into full-time ministry, I was eight years old and I was, uh, my mom is a singer. She is classically trained and we were at this large missions conference and I'm just going with my family, I'm eight, you know? Um, but they gave an opportunity that's like, if you feel led to give your life for the Lord for full-time ministry, come forward. It was like a call for missions. And it was unexplainably like a hook from my gut that pulled me to the front of this room. And all I know how to describe it is a crashing down and a welling up cyclone kind of moment with the Lord. And I knew that he was calling me into giving my life, whatever it looked like, to follow him into full-time ministry. And I feel like there are some of you today that know that you're called for something just as I'm talking, you're, you're feeling your heart pulled. And there might be disappointment, there might be a dimming taking place. But if you feel like as I'm talking, 
that there's just like, I gotta, I gotta raise my hand. There's just a compelling within me, like, and you know that that's you. Can you raise your hand right now and keep that up for a moment? Okay, give you another moment. Okay, family, can we gather around these people? Keep your hands up until you have one or two people laying hands on you. We're gonna just pray for a fresh commissioning on these people's lives this morning. If it's a full-time call or a missional call, or maybe they just need, there's something in there that's speaking. I want us to be the body. And um, when I count to three, we're gonna all pray out loud, bold prayers. Just seek the Lord what he wants to just um, infuse in this moment in these people's lives. If you don't have, if you don't have someone, gather around, little, make little fire pits. <laughs> And I want us to really go after this, okay? Everyone involved. Um, if you've got people to, like laying hands on you, you can put your hands down and you can just receive. All right, church, let's go ahead and pray out for about 30 seconds to a minute. Powerful prayers from the Lord. Ready? One, two, three. Out loud, let's go. another 15 seconds. Let's go. I just felt like the Lord was wanting to give permission to the person that's actually been feeling that they're supposed to leave Los Angeles. And I feel like maybe you have felt shame because you're like, oh no, I'm leaving the rat race and I'm going to miss out on so much. But I just want to give you faith right now that before Jesus started his ministry, he left for 40 days in the wilderness. And I, I, I just, I feel like the Lord is saying there's permission to go away with me for a long time that you staying here every single day is gonna cause some crazy breakthrough, but actually going and meeting him before you start the rest of your life is really important. And so is there anybody in here that has actually been afraid to leave LA and you have just been staying here? Would you just raise your hand? Nice and high. Yeah, a few people in the back. Okay, praise God. I'm just gonna pray. I feel like there's a few more where your heart has actually been calling you to leave LA. And so, Father, I just pray that you would give them the boldness in Jesus' name. Father, that you would show them where to go, that it would not come with shame or a fear of missing out, but in Jesus' name that you would lead them to where you've been calling them, Lord, with peace and guidance. Amen. Cool, yeah, kind of parallel to that, I felt like a huge reason people were scared to leave or even scared to go deeper with the Lord is because they didn't know what true love was. And I was just sitting back there and I was literally asking the Lord what true love was and I saw Jesus' dead body. And I know that's a gory sight, but then he filled me with his love. And as Tommy was speaking, I was thinking those people truly loved the Lord. And so if you've been searching for true love, like whether it's been through a spouse or through substances or addictions, could you just raise your hand? Because I know true love and I can testify that Jesus is true love. He wants to fill your heart with true love. The reason he died was because we are dead in our trespasses he died so that we could raise with him forever. And if you accept Jesus, you are seated in heavenly places. That is 
a now tense, not a future tense. It is when you accept Jesus, you have been seated in heavenly places. So I just want to pray that you would receive love, whether it's for the first time or for a, it's been a long time. The love of the man with eyes of fire wants to meet you. And that is true love, eyes of fire. His eyes are on fire because he's fascinated with you. He's mesmerized by you. And we've been taught a lot that there's this striving in the church, but the Spirit's ministry is forgiveness. And so, Lord, I just thank you that right now love would fall on every person, not even the people that just raise their hand, but every person in this room, that we would experience the tangible love of Jesus. I thank you that you have reconciled us through the cross. So I ask that right now we would see the eyes of fire. We would be changed by the eyes of fire, by love. That all we could think for the rest of our days is a man named Jesus loved us, loves us. So I thank you that you love us. I ask that you would redefine, you would, you would use your eyes of fire to, to melt away any lie of love. So I thank you for true love today. Today is a marking of true love. October 20th is a day of true love. So I thank you, Jesus, that today we, we receive your love fully. We thank you that you would teach us what true love is. So we submit, we just rebuke any lie we've believed of love, any lie we've been taught, any lie we've been indoctrinated with of love. And we receive your spirit today and say, show us love. So we thank you for love. We ask that you would enter our hearts. You would renew our minds with true love. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, I also felt there was a few people who, you came out to LA to be somebody, and I felt maybe you had bought this Hollywood lie. And you've begun to put your worth into your work, and you are just never satisfied. And you begin to reach success and it's never enough and you have climbed this ladder for years and years and years and you're never content. And I just, I wanna break that in Jesus' name right now that your worth cannot be put into what you do but into what he's done. And so I, I do feel like there's a lot. And I, I'm just gonna ask that you to close your eyes and if you have been putting your worth in your work, would you just raise your hand? Yeah, I, there, there, there's many more. And I'm just gonna ask the Lord that he would actually come and be your satisfaction. And, and, I, and I really wanna invite you to repent right now of Lord, I have not put myself into you, but in the things that I can do for you. And it, it has never once been enough. And so just put a hand on your heart if you're praying with me. I'm just gonna pray, Jesus, would you come and be our full portion? Jesus, would you be enough? Father, I even repent. Just even begin to repent to yourself, to the Lord. Father, I repent for how I have put all of my worth in the things that I have done. Jesus, I say that we would turn from our ways and fully look to you. That there would never be another first love besides you in our life again, Jesus. Just even repent to the Lord, even if you didn't raise your hand, that he has not been your first love. And you have made the things that you could do your first love. Father, would you take first place again? Yeah. Um, I actually just felt led to invite people to take a knee to bow. Um, so I'm going to do it. But um, Holy Spirit, just thank you for the gift of surrender. Um, and in light of what Tommy spoke of tonight, God, we just declare that our lives are not our own. We declare it in the name of Jesus. We declare that our lives are not our own, that our lives are not our own, that we will not find our home in this earth. We will lay it at your feet. Father, thank you that it's your perfect love that comes and leads us into this kind of surrender. That it's your perfect presence that leads us into this kind of surrender. It's not something that we can muster up or force. So Father, I pray that you would do the work in us, that we would be your laid down lovers in this city, in this nation, and that we would go wherever you say go, and we would be faithful to be found pure and righteous in your eyes, King Jesus. 
Lord, would you fill our mouths with the gospel? Would you fill our lives with your love, Lord Jesus? Can this just not be a song that we sing where we say, fill us up and catch us up in your story and fill our lives with your glory? God, we actually want it. We want your story over our life. Jesus. We want your story over our lives. We don't want to be the author of our life, God. So forgive us. Show. <laughs> forgive us, God for the areas that we have tried to direct our steps and lead us again, Lord. Lead us again, Lord God, you are our God. And we declare that over this house, that you are the God of this house, that you are the God of our lives, that you are the one that we serve. You are the one true living King. Ha! And every other lover is an idol. So we crash it at your feet and we say, have your way in us and through us in Jesus' name. May we not be the same. May we actually be changed. May we be transformed, Jesus. May you take our hearts and make them yours in a very real way. This is not a game, God. It's not a game. And we, we repent of the areas where we've taken the gospel and the reality of surrender um, at, at a level that it not actually is. We want to see you rightly, King Jesus, and we want to lay our lives down rightly. This life is not our own. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to, I want to end with this. Um, there's such an invitation of surrender in the house, and um, the best invitation is salvation, <laughs> and where God completely changes us and makes us new. It's the good news of the gospel. And I just was sensing um, Michelle Cole here is, is such a woman that embodies home and the unconditional love of God. And so I just felt like she's supposed to invite um, an altar call here of salvation. So I'm going to hand it off to her. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. I'd like to invite each one of you here who does not know the Lord as your savior. If you would just surrender your heart right now all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. You don't have to look any certain way, you don't have to act any certain way, you don't have to fix yourself up, you don't have to dress any way. He meets you right where you are. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling and he's calling you home. He says, come home to me, come home to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, your yoke, my, take my yoke upon you. He's calling you, that voice you've been hearing, that wooing, he knows your name, his thoughts towards you are endless. So and I'd like to invite you, if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you have not asked him to come into your life, just as a confession, raise your hand. We don't have to make a big deal of it, but if you would just raise your hand as a confession of, Jesus, I want you. Jesus, wash me in the blood. And then if we could just all pray together. Father, I ask you to forgive me for my sins. I ask you just to come and cleanse me with your blood. I thank you that you died on the cross and got up the day, got up again on the third day that I might have life and have life eternally. It is by your blood that I am made whole. It is because you are the Lamb of God who gave up your life, who stood in front of the whoop, who bore the lashes for me, who was a perfect sacrifice that I might live, that I give myself to you, Lord. And I ask you to consume me with your love.
I laid it all down at the foot of the cross. I surrender it all to you, Jesus. We give it to you, Lord God. If you prayed this prayer for the first time today, when the service is over, if you would just come down and let someone walk you through it and just pray you and welcome you into the family of Christ. If you played this prayer for the first time today, if there's somebody standing beside you who witnessed you praying that prayer with me in agreement with me today, you would just hug them right now and wrap your arms around it. I heard the Lord speaking while Catherine was praying. He said, the snare is broken and you have escaped. The snare that the enemy has held you in, the things that he has weighted you down with, the snare is broken and you have escaped. The snare is broken by the Lamb of God who stands at the, at the cross and says, come unto me and you have escaped. Be, we glorify you, Lord. We magnify you, Lord, and we give you all the honor and glory and praise. I know you didn't do it traditionally where you repeat after me, but if you prayed this in your heart and you asked him to forgive you and you said, Jesus, I love you and forgive me for my sins, you are saved. It's just that easy. I believe you are the son of God. I believe you were born and died and raised again. I believe you sit on the right hand of God the Father and that's it. That is it. Everything else we do is just icing on the cake and a benefit of being a part of the body of Christ. The prophetic, the deliverance, the, the wholeness that you feel, the joy that you feel, all that is the benefit of being in the body of Christ. Oh, that's this morning in pre-service prayer, we said, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh in this place. Spirit of the living God, we thank you that you are falling fresh in this place, that we are learning how to walk through life with you, that you never leave us or forsake us, that you are our joy and our salvation. So we bless you, Lord, and we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you for the souls that have been saved. We thank you for those who have been set free. We thank you for the adding to the kingdom daily. In Jesus' name we pray. And please, come down. Let us hug you. Let us love you more. Let us walk with you in this journey. You are not alone. We want to walk with you in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're officially done for today, but we're, let's just, it's a special thing that God's doing this morning. So if you just want to stay at your seat and just kind of sit in it, you're welcome to um, just be respectful of those individuals if they're on the ground or um, need, need a little space with connecting with the Lord for a while. When you're ready, please take your chairs to this corner and that'd be really helpful for us. We love you guys. We bless you. Holy Spirit, seal what you're doing today.